The Continued Story of Taryn, the Assistant Pig Keeper. I'm glad you've stayed to listen. Now sit round, as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 9. Fluter Flam. Taryn's sword leapt out. The man in the cloak hurriedly dropped Melangar's bridle and darted behind a tree. Taryn swung the blade. Pieces of bark sprayed the air. While the stranger ducked back and forth, Taryn slashed and thrust, hacking wildly at bushes and branches. "'You're not Gwydion!' he shouted. "'Well, never claimed I was!' Tra the stranger shouted back. "'If you think I'm Gwydion, you're dreadfully mistaken!' "'Come out of there!' Taryn ordered, thrusting again. "'Certainly not while you're swinging that enormous—' "'Here now, watch that! Great beetling! I was safer in Akron's dungeon!' "'Come out now, or you won't be able to!' Taryn shouted. He redoubled his attack, ripping furiously through the underbrush. "'Truce! Truce!' called the stranger. "'You can't smite an unarmed man!' Helenry, who had been a few paces behind Taryn, ran up and seized his arm. "'Stop it!' she cried. "'That's no way to treat your friend, after I went to all the trouble of rescuing him.' Taryn shook off Helenry. "'What treachery is this?' he shouted. "'You've left my companion to die. You've been with Akron all along. I should have known it. You're no better than she is!' With a cry of anguish, he raised his sword. Helenry ran, sobbing into the woods. Taryn dropped the blade and stood with bowed head. The stranger ventured from behind the tree. Truce? he inquired again. Believe me, if I'd known I was going to cause all this trouble, I wouldn't have listened to that red-headed girl. Taryn did not raise his head. The stranger took a few more very cautious steps. Humblest apologies for disappointing you, he said. I'm awfully flattered you mistook me for Prince Gwydion. There's hardly any resemblance, except for possibly a certain air of... I do not know who you are, Taryn said bitterly. I do know that a brave man has bought my, bought your life for you. I am Fluter Flam, son of Godo, the stranger said, bowing deeply, a bard of the harp at your service. I have no need of bards, Taren said. A harp will not bring my com back my companion to life. Lord Quidian is dead? Fluter Flam asked. These are sorrowful tidings. He is a kinsman, and I owe allegiance to the House of Dawn. But why do you blame his death on me? If Gwydion has brought, bought my life, at least tell me how, and I shall mourn with you. Go your way, said Taryn. It is no fault of yours. I trusted Gwydion's life to a traitor and a liar. My own life should be forfeit. Well, these are hard words to apply to a winsome lass, said the bard, especially one who isn't here to defend herself. I want no explanation from her, he said. There is nothing she can tell me. She can lose herself in the forest for all I care. Well, if she's such a traitor, and a liar, as you say, Fluter remarked, then you're lettering her off easily. You may not want her explanation, but I'm quite sure Gwydion would. Allow me to suggest you go and find her, before she strays too far. Taryn nodded. Yes, he said coldly. Gwydion shall have justice. He turned on his heel and walked towards the trees. Ellen Reed had gone no great distance. He could see the glow of the sphere a few paces ahead, where the girl sat on a boulder in a clearing. She looked small and thin, her head was pressed into her hands, and her shoulders shook. "'Now you've made me cry!' she burst out as Taryn approached. "'I hate crying. It makes my nose feel like a melted icicle. You've hurt my feelings, you stupid assistant pig-keeper, and all for something that's your own fault to begin with!' Taryn was so taken aback that he began to stammer. "'Yes!' cried Ellen Lee. "'It's every bit your fault. You were so closed-mouthed about the man you wanted me to rescue, and you kept talking about your friend in the other cell. Very well. I rescued whoever it was in the other cell. You didn't tell me there was anyone else in the dungeon. There wasn't, though. Ellen Lee insisted. Fluter Flam, or whatever he calls himself, was the only one. Then where is my companion? Taryn demanded. Where is Gwydion? I don't know, Ellen Lee said. He wasn't in Akron's dungeon, that's for sure. What's more, he never was. Taryn realized the girl was speaking the truth. As his memory returned, he recalled that Gwydion had been with him only briefly. He had not seen the guards put him in a cell. Taryn had only guessed at that. Well, what could she have done with him? I haven't any idea in the world, Ellen said, and sniffed. She could have brought him into her chambers, or locked him in the tower. There's a dozen places she could have hidden him. All you needed to say was, Go and rescue a man named Gwydion, and I would have found him. But no, you had to be so clever about it and keep everything to yourself. 
Terran's heart sank. I must go back to the castle and find him. Will you show me where Akron might have imprisoned him? There's nothing left of the castle, said Elenmi. Besides, I'm not sure I'm going to help you any more at all after the way you've behaved. And calling me those horrid names. That's like putting caterpillars in somebody's hair. She tossed her head and put her chin in the air and refused to look at him. I accused you falsely, Terran said. My shame is as deep as my sorrow. Elenry, without lowering her chin, gave him a sidelong glance. Well, I should think it would be. I shall... I shall seek him alone, said Terran. You are right in refusing to help. It is no concern of yours. He turned and started out of the clearing. Well, you don't have to agree with me so quickly, Elenry cried. She slid off the boulder and hastened after him. Flutterflam was still waiting when they returned. In the light of Elenry's sphere, Terran had a better view of this unexpected arrival. The bard was tall and lanky, with a long, pointed nose. His great shock of bright yellow hair burst out in every direction like a ragged sun. His jacket and leggings were patched at knees and elbows, and soon with large, clumsy stitches, the work, Terran was certain, of the bard himself. A harp with a beautiful, sweeping curve was slung from his shoulders. But otherwise, he looked nothing at all like the bards Terran had learned about from the Book of Three. So it seems I've been rescued by mistake, Fluter Flam said after Terran explained what had happened. I should have known it would turn out to be something like that. I kept asking myself, crawling along through those beastly tunnels, who could possibly be interested whether I was languishing in a dungeon or not. I am going back to the castle, Terran said. There may be hope that Gwydion still lives. Well, by all means, cried the bard, his eyes lighting up. A flam to the rescue! Storm the castle! Carry it by assault! Batter down the gates! Well, there's nothing left of it to storm, said Elenly. Oh, said Fluter, with disappointment. Uh, very well, then. We shall do the best we can. At the summit of the hill, the mighty blocks of stone lay as if crushed by a giant fist. Only the square arch of the gate remained upright, gaunt as a bone. In the moonlight, the ruin seemed already ancient. Shreds of mist hung over the shattered tower. Akrand had learned of his escape, Terran guessed, for at the moment of the castle's destruction, she had sent out a company of guards. Amid the rubble, their bodies sprawled, motionless as the stones. With growing despair, Terran climbed over the ruins. The foundations of the castle had collapsed. The walls had fallen inward. The bard and Elenry helped Terran try to shift one or two of the broken rocks, but the work was beyond their strength. At last, the exhausted Terran shook his head. We can do no more, he murmured. This shall stand as Gwydion's burial mound. He stood a moment, looking silently over the desolation, then turned away. Fluter suggested taking weapons from the bodies of the guard. He equipped himself with a dagger, sword, and a spear, in addition to the blade he had taken from the barrow. Elenry carried a slim dagger at her waist. Terran clicked as many bows and quivers of arrows as he could carry. The group was now lightly, but effectively armed. With heavy hearts, the little band made their way down the slope. Melangar followed docilely, her head bowed as if she understood that she would not see her master again. "'I must leave this er evil place,' Terran cried. "'I am impatient to be gone from here. Spiral Castrol has only brought me grief. I have no wish to see it again.' "'Well, what has it brought the rest of us?' Elenry asked. "'You make it sound as though we were sitting around having a splendid time while you moan and carry on.' Terran stopped abruptly. "'I... I am sorry, he said. I did not mean it that way. Furthermore, said Elenry, you're mistaken if you think I'm going to go marching through the woods in the middle of the night. And I, put in Fluter, I don't mind telling you I'm so tired I could sleep on Akron's doorstep. We all need rest, Terran said, but I don't trust Akron, alive or dead, when we still know nothing of the cauldron born. If they escaped, they may be looking for us right now. No matter how tired we are, it would be foolhardy to stay this close. Elenry and Fluter agreed to continue on for a little distance. After a time, they found a spot well protected by trees and flung themselves wearily to the turf. Terran unsettled Melangar, thankful the girl had thought to bring along Gwydion's gear. He found a cloak in the saddlebag and handed it to Elenry. The bard wrapped himself in his own tattered garment and set his harp carefully on a knotted root. Terran stood the first watch. Thoughts of the livid warriors still haunted him, and he saw their faces in every shadow. 
as the nights wore on, night wore on, the passage of a forest creature, or the restless sighing of the wind in the leaves made him start. The bushes rustled. This time, it was not the wind. He heard a faint scratching, and his hand flew to his sword. A figure bounded into the moonlight and rolled up to Terran. "'Crunchings and munchings?' whimpered a voice. "'Who is your peculiar friend?' asked the bard, sitting up and looking curiously at this new arrival. "'For an assistant pig-keeper,' remarked Emily, "'you do keep strange company. "'Where did you find it, and what is it? "'I've never seen anything like that in my life.' "'He is no friend of mine,' cried Tyrion. "'He is a miserable, sneaking wretch "'who deserted us as soon as we were attacked.' "'No, no,' Gurgy protested, "'whimpering and bobbing his matted head. "'Poor Gurgy, poor humble Gurgy, "'is always faithful to mighty lords. "'What joy to serve them, "'even with shakings and breakings.' Tell the truth, said Terran. You ran off when we needed you the most. Slashings and gashings are for noble lords, not for poor, weak Gurgy. Oh, fearsome whistling of blades. Gurgy ran to look for help, mighty lord. You did not succeed in finding any, Terran said angrily. Oh, sadness, Gurgy moaned. There was no help for brave warriors. Gurgy went far, far with great squawkings and shriekings. I am sure you did, Terran said. What else can unhappy Gurgi do? He is sorry to see great warriors in distress, oh, tears of misery. But in battle, what would there be for poor Gurgi except hurtful guttings and cuttings of his throat? Well, it wasn't very brave, said Omli, but it wasn't altogether stupid either. I don't see what advantage there was for him to be chopped up, especially if he wasn't any help to you in the first place. Oh, wisdom of a noble lady! Gurgi cried, throwing himself at Elenry's feet. If Gurgi had not gone seeking help, he would not be here to serve you now, but he is here. Yes, yes, faithful Gurgi returns to beatings and bruisings from the terrifying warrior. Just keep out of sight, Terran said, or you really will have something to complain about. Gurgi snuffled. Gurgi hastens to obey, mighty lord. He will say no more, not even whisperings of what he saw. No, he will not disturb the sleepings of powerful heroes. See how he leaves with tearful farewells. Come back here immediately, Terran called. Gurgi brightened. Crunchings? Listen to me, Terran said. There's hardly enough to go around, but I'll give you a fair share of what we have. After that, you'll have to find your own munchings. Gurgi nodded. Many more hosts march in the valley with sharp spears. Oh, many more. Gurgi watches so quietly and cleverly. He does not ask them for help. No, they would only give him harmful hurtings. What's this? What's this? cried Fluter. A great host. I should love to see them. I always enjoy processions and that sort of thing. The enemies of the House of Dawn are gathering, Terran hurriedly told the bard. Gwydion and I saw them before we were captured. Now, if Gurgi speaks the truth, they, are, they have gathered reinforcements. The bard sprang to his feet. A phlegm never shrinks from danger. The mightier foe, the greater the glory. We shall seek them out, set upon them. The bards shall sing our praises forever. Carried away by Fluther's enthusiasm, Terran seized his sword, and then shook his head, remembering Gwydion's words in the forest near Cairdalden. No, no he said slowly. It would be folly to think of attacking them. He smiled quickly at Fluter. The bards would sing of us, he admitted, but we would be in no position to appreciate it. Fluter sat down again, disappointed. You can talk about the bards singing your praises all you want, said Elmley. I'm in no mood to do battle. I'm going to sleep. And with that, she curled up on the ground and pulled the cloak over her head. Still unconvinced, Fluter settled himself against the tree root for his turn at, gr at guard. Gurgi curled up at Elony's feet. Exhausted though he was, Terran lay awake. In his mind, he saw again the Horned King, and heard the screams from the flaming cages. He sat up quickly, grieving for his companion. He had forgotten what had brought him there. His own quest had been for Henwen, Gwydion's to warn the Sons of Dawn. Terran's head spun, with his companions surely dead. Should he now try to make his way to Cairdathel? What then would become of Henwen? Everything had ceased to be simple. He yearned for the peacefulness of Cairdalban, yearned even to weed the vegetable gardens and make horseshoes. He turned restlessly, finding no answer. At last his weariness overcame him, and he slept. 
plunged into nightmares. Chapter 10 The Sword of Durnwin It was full daylight when Terran opened his eyes. Gurgi was already sniffing hungrily at the saddlebag. Terran ro rose quickly and shared out as much of the remaining provisions as he dared, keeping a small amount in reserve, since he had no idea how difficult it would be to find food during the coming journey. In the course of the restless night, he had reached the decision, though at present he refrained from speaking of it, still unsure he had chosen wisely. For the moment, he concentrated on a meager breakfast. Gurgi, sitting cross-legged, devoured his food with so many outcries of pleasure and loud smackings of his lips that he seemed to be eating twice as much as he really did. Fluter bolted his scant portion as though he had not enjoyed a meal for at least five days. Ellenwe was more interested in the sword she had taken from the barrel. It lay across her knees, and, with a perplexed frown, the tip of her tongue between her lips, the girl was studying the weapon curiously. As Terran drew near, Ellenwe snatched the sword away. Well, said Terran with a la laugh, you needn't act as if I was going to steal it from you. Although jewels studded the hilt and pommel, the scabbard was battered, discolored, nearly black with age. For all that, it had an air of ancient lineage, and Terran was eager to hold it. Come, he said, let me see the blade. I dare not, cried Eleni. To Terran's great surprise, he saw that her face was solemn and almost fearful. There is a symbol of power on the scabbard, Eleni continued. I have seen this mark before on some of Akron's things. It always means something forbidden. Of course, all Akron's things are like that, but some are more forbidden than others. There's another inscription, too, said Eleni, frowning again, but it's in the old writing. She stamped her foot. Oh, I do wish Akron had finished teaching it to me. I can almost make it out, but not quite. And there's something... There's something irritating. It's like not finishing what you started out to say. Fluter came up just then, and he too peered at the strange weapon. Comes from a barrow, eh? The bard shook his spiky yellow head and whisp whistled. I suggest getting out of it immediately. Never had much confidence in things you find in barrows. It's a bad business having anything to do with them. You can't be sure what, where else they've been and who all's had them. Well, if it's an enchanted weapon, Terran said, more interested than ever in getting his hands on the sword. Shouldn't we keep it? Oh, do be quiet, Helen we cried. I can't hear myself think. I don't see what you're both talking about, getting rid of it or not getting rid of it. After all, it's mine, isn't it? I found it, I carried it out, and almost got stuck in a dirty old tunnel because of it. Bards are under supposed to understand these things, Darren said. Well, naturally, Fluter answered, smiling confidently as putting his long nose closer to the scabbard. These inscriptions are all pretty much the same. I see this one's on the scabbard rather than the blade. It says something like, uh, oh, beware my wrath, the usual sentiments. At that moment, there was a loud twang, as fl and Fluter blinked. One of his harp strings had snapped. Ah, uh, hey, excuse me, he said, and went to see about his instrument. It doesn't say anything like that at all, Ellen Reed declared. I can read some of it now. Here, it starts near the hilt and goes winding around like ivy. I was looking at it the wrong way. It says Durnwin first. I don't know whether that's the name of the sword or the name of the king. Oh yes, that's the name of the sword. Here it is again. Draw Durnwin, only thou of royal blood, to rule, to strike the... the... something or other. Elenry went on. It's very faint. I can't see it. The letters are worn too smooth. No. That's odd. They aren't worn. They've been scratched out. They must have been cut deeply, because there's still a trace. But I can't read the rest. This word looks as if it might be... Death? She shuddered. That's not very cheerful. Let me unsheathe it, Terran urged again. There might be more on the blade. Certainly not, said Eleni. I told you it had a symbol of power, and I'm bound by it. That's elementary. Akron cannot bind you any longer. It isn't Akron, Eleni answered. I only said she had things with the same mark. This is a stronger enchantment than any she could make. I'm quite sure. I wouldn't dare to draw it, and I don't intend letting you either. Besides, it says only royal blood, and doesn't mention a word about assistant pig keepers. Well, how can you tell I haven't any royal blood? Terran asked, bristling. I wasn't born an assistant pig keeper. For all you know, my father might have been a king. It happens all the time in the Book of Three. Well, I've never heard of the Book of Three, said Olenwe. But in the first place, I don't think it's good enough to be a king's son or even a king himself. 
Royal blood is just a way of translating. In the old writing, it didn't mean only having royal relatives. Anybody can have those. It meant, oh, I don't know what you'd call it, something very special. It seems to me that if you have it, you don't need to wonder whether you have it. So, of course, said Taryn, nettled by the girl's remarks, you've made up your mind that I'm not, whatever it is. I didn't mean to offend you, Ellen Lee said quickly. For an assistant peekkeeper, I think you're quite remarkable, even though you're the nicest person. I even think you're the nicest person I've ever met in my life. It's just that I'm forbidden to let you have the sword, and that's that. What will you do with it, then? Well, keep it, naturally. I'm not going to drop it down a well, am I? Taryn snorted. You'd make a fine sight, a little girl carrying a sword. Well, I'm not a little girl, said Elmi, tossing her hair in exasperation. Among my people in the olden days, the sword maidens did battle besides the men. Well, it's not the olden days now, Taryn said. Instead of a sword, you should be carrying a doll. Elenui, with a squeal of vexation, raised a hand to slap at Taryn when Fl Fluter Flam returned. Here now, said the bard, no squabbling. There's not a bit of use to it. With a large key, he tightened the wooden peg holding the newly repaired harp string. Elenui turned her irritation on Fluter. That inscription was a very important one. It didn't say anything about bewaring anyone's wrath. You didn't read it right at all. You're a fine bard if you can make, can't make out the writing on an enchanted sword. Well, uh, you see, the truth of the matter is, said Fluter, clearing his throat and speaking with much hesitation, is, it's, uh, it's, um, this way. I'm not officially a bard. Well, I didn't know there were unofficial bards, Ellen, we said. Oh, yes, indeed, said Fluter, at least in my case. I'm also a king. A king, Taran said. Sire, he dropped to one knee. None of that, none of that, said Fluter. I don't bother with it any more. Where is your kingdom? Ellen, we asked. Several days' journey east of Cairdathel, said Fluter. It is a vast realm. At this, Taran heard another jangling. Drat that thing, said the bard. There go two more strings. As I was saying, yes, well, it is actually a rather, uh, small kingdom in the north. Very dull and dreary. So I gave it up. I'd always loved barding and wandering, and that's what I decided to do. Well, I thought bards had to study a great deal, Eleni said. A person can't just go and decide. Yes, that was one of the problems, said the former king. I studied. I did quite well in the examinations. A small string at the upper end of the harp broke with a high-pitched tinkle and curled up like an ivy tendril. I did quite poorly, he went on, and the council of bards would not admit me. Really, they want you to know so much these days, volumes and volumes of poetry, and chants and music, and calculating the seasons and history and all kinds of alphabets you spell out on your fingers and secret signs. A man couldn't hope to cram it all into his skull. The council was very nice to me, continued Fluter. Talazan, the chief bard himself, presented me with this harp. He said it was exactly what I needed. I sometimes wonder if he was really doing me a favor at all. It's a very ni nice harp, but I have such trouble with the strings. I'd throw it away and get another, but it has a beautiful tone. I should never find one as good, if only the beastly strings. They do seem to break frequently, Eleni began. Yes. That's so, Fluter admitted, a little sheepishly. I've noticed it usually happens when I'm, uh... Well, I'm an emotional sort of fellow, and I do get carried away. I might, um... Readjust the facts slightly. Purely for dramatic effect, you understand. Well, if you'd stop readjusting the facts quite so much... Or quite so often, Eleni said, perhaps you wouldn't have that trouble with the harp. Yes, I suppose said the bard with a sigh. I try, but it's hard, very hard. As a king, you get into the habit. Sometimes I think I pass more time fixing strings than playing. But there it is. You can't have everything. So where were you journeying when Akron had captured you? Taran asked. Oh, no place in particular, said Fluter. That's one advantage. You don't have to hurry to get somewhere. You keep moving, and next thing you know, there you are. Unfortunately, in this case, it was Akron's dungeon. She didn't care for my playing. That woman has no ear for music, he added, shuddering. Sire, Taranet said, I ask a boon. Please, said the former king, Fluter will do very well. A boon? Delighted, 
I haven't done any boon granting since I gave up my throne. Fluterflam and Elenwy seated themselves on the turf, while Terran recounted his search for Henwen, and what Gwydion had told him of the Horned King and the rising of the Cantrives. Gurgi, having finished his meal, sidled over and squatted on a hillock to listen. There is no doubt in my mind, Terran went on, the Sons of Dawn must have news of the uprising before the Horned King strikes. If he triumphs, Aron will have Prydain by the throat. I have seen with my own eyes what that means. He felt ill at ease, speaking as if he himself were a war leader in a council hall, but soon the words began to come easier. Perhaps he thought, because he was speaking for Gwydion. I see your plan, Fluter inter interrupted. You shall keep on looking for your pig, and you want me to warn the warriors of dawn. Splendid! I shall start off immediately, and if the hosts of the Horned King overtake me... The bard slashed and thrust the air. They shall know the valor of a phlegm. Terran shook his head. No, I shall journey to Caradathel myself. I do not question your valor, he said to the bard, but the danger is too great. I ask no one else to face it in my stead. When do you intend to seek your pig? asked Luder. My own quest, said Terran, looking at the bard, must be given up. If it is possible, after the first task is done, I mean to return to it. Until then, I serve only Gwydion. It was I who cost him his life, and it is justice for me to do what I believe he should have done. As I grasp the situation, said the bard, I think you're taking too much blame on yourself. You had no way of knowing Gwydion wasn't in the dungeon. It changes nothing, Terran answered. I have made my decision. Fluter was about to protest, but the firmness of Terran's words silenced the bard. After a moment, he asked, Well, what is your boon, then? It is twofold, said Terran. First, tell me how I may reach Cairdathel as quickly as possible. Second, I beg you to conduct this girl safely to her own people. Before Fluter could open his mouth, Elenry gave an indignant cry and leapt to her feet. Conducted? I shall not be conducted anywhere. I'm not going to be sent back, just so I can be sent somewhere else, and it'll be another dreary place, you can be sure. No, I shall go to Cairdathel, too. There is risk enough, Terran declared, without having to worry about a girl. Elenry put her hands on her hips. Her eyes flashed. I don't like being called a girl. And this girl, as if I didn't have a name at all, it's like having your head put in a sack. If you've made your decision, I've made my own. I don't see how you're going to stop me. If you, she hurried on, pointing at the bard, try to conduct me to my mean, stupid kinsmen, and they're hardly related to me in the first place, that harp will be in pieces around your ears. Fluter blinked and clutched his harp protectively while Elenry went on. And if a certain assistant pig-keeper, I won't even mention his name, thinks otherwise, he'll be even more mistaken. Everyone started, topping it, stock, started talking at once. Stop it! cried Terran at the top of his voice. Very well, he said, after the others grew quiet. You, he said to Elenry, could be tied up and set on Melangar. But, he added, raising his hand before the girl could interrupt, that will not be done. Not because of all the commotion you raised, but because I realize now it is for the best. The bard looked surprised. Terran continued, There is greater safety in greater numbers. Whatever happens, there will be more chance for one of us to reach Cairdathel. I believe we should all stay together. And faithful Gurji too, shouted Gurji. He will follow. Too many wicked enemies are smirking and lurking to jab at him with pointy spears. If he agrees, Terran said, Fluter shall act as guide. But I warn you, he added, glancing at Gurgi and Elemy. Nothing hinders our task. Well, ordinarily, said Fluter, I prefer to be in charge of this type of expedition myself. But, he went on as Terran was about to protest, since you are acting for Lord Quidian, I accept your authority as I would accept his. He bowed low. A flame is yours to command. Forward, then, the bard cried, and if we must give battle, so be it. Why, I've carved my way through walls of spearmen. Six harp strings broke at once, and the others strained so tautly they looked on the verge of snapping. While Terran settled Melangar, the bard set ruefully to work repairing his harp. This concludes Chapter 10. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day.
you deserve it.